Dr. O here, and welcome to Chapter 4, where we take a dive into the world of molecules and compounds. So what sort of things are we going to do in Chapter 4? Well, in Chapter 4, we are going to uh, learn about chemical formulas. We are going to learn how to write chemical formulas. We will learn the Lewis model for putting uh, molecules together, because there's a way to do that. We're going to learn how to name the different types of compounds that we can create. And we'll learn the relationship between the mass of a molecule, the percent mass of the formula, and how to use all of these in mathematical equations, which of course means dimensional analysis. It's a big chapter. There's a lot of detail. None of it's particularly hard, but that means a lot of information. But it all relates, which is good, because some chapters is just, you know, pieces of information loosely sewn together. So that it all relates hopefully will make it flow together easily for you. So let's get started. We'll begin our talk with chemical bonds. So what is a chemical bond? Well, it's a force that holds atoms together. So you might be asking yourself, why do atoms get held together? Why do atoms bond? Well, number one, it's because it lowers potential energy of the atoms involved in the bond. And number two, it creates stability with this union. You see, we're, this is the deal with Mother Nature. She is a drama queen, but she's also lazy. So she has a tendency to drive reactions so that it lowers the energy of the system. The system could be two atoms and it creates stability between them. There are a variety of types of bonds. We're going to be focusing on two, one of them being the ionic bond. And as the name implies, we will be dealing with ions. And we can say that an ionic bond, then, is the union between a cation and an anion, and that's true. We could also say that it is the bond between a metal and a nonmetal, and this, too, is true. And another way we could describe an ionic bond is to say that it's the transfer of electrons from one atom to another atom, and this also is true. Now, we've seen diagrams like this from Chapter 3. And let's say that our sodium friend loses that outer electron, and let's say that chlorine finds it. By transferring its outer electron to chlorine, we have now created a more stable sodium ion, because we have eight electrons in its newly created, I say created, it was there before, but now the outer valence has eight uh, electrons in it. And we have also at the same time created a more stable chlorine ion, a chloride, because now it too has eight electrons. It has accomplished that octet. So this is the beauty and the nature of the ionic bond. The other bond that we're going to talk about a lot is the covalent bond. Now let's look at that word covalent. What does co mean? Well, what does it mean when you co-parent or when you cohabitate or when you co-pilot? It means that you do <clears throat> some sort of sharing activity. And the second part of that word valent sounds suspiciously like valence. And indeed, it has to do with the valence electrons, because all chemical reactions are driven by valence electrons. But instead of transferring those valent electrons in a covalent bond, the atoms share them. So what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at these two hydrogen atoms that we have here. And we can say that uh, each hydrogen atom has one electron, but its orbital could hold two electrons, and if it could get its hands on another electron, that hydrogen would have a full valence shell and be very happy, very stable. Well, if it comes together with another hydrogen, what, the, what has a tendency to happen is that, let's say this dark gray hydrogen will share its one at electron with the light gray hydrogen. And then maybe the light gray hydrogen will share its um, one electron with the dark gray hydrogen. And if you notice, 
at least part of the time, both of those electrons are hovering around one nucleus, which means that in that moment, that particular hydrogen has a full valence shell. And that's a very stable configuration. Mother Nature has a tendency to drive these sorts of reactions together. And in this way, both of these two hydrogens, by sharing their one electron, have in essence accomplished a full valence shell. Now, what type of atoms are doing this sort of union? Well, it's nonmetals. It's two nonmetals coming together doing that sharing. Now, which is different because then an ionic bond, because ionic bonds are um, a, a metal and a nonmetal. So two nonmetals, those uh, atoms that have a tendency to live in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. There's just a handful of them, not a lot of them. Um, I would suggest that you familiarize yourself with them so you can kind of spot them or at least be suspicious that that's what you're dealing with. Now, the other interesting thing about a covalent bond is this it forms something known as a molecular compound. What I mean by that is that when two atoms come together and they share their electrons, they have a tendency to create something that is very different than what they were as a single atom. So let's take a look at that. So here we have a couple of gas, uh, hydrogen gas atoms, and they do have a tendency to run around the universe as gas. And let's say we introduce them to an oxygen molecule, which also has a tendency to run around the universe as a gas. Now, if these three characters decide to start sharing electrons and the bond forms between them, a covalent bond, then they no longer behave like a gas as a result of that union they now behave as a liquid. So that's what I mean when I say a molecular compound has a, an identity that can be completely different than the atoms that make it up. So in essence, we have taken three gas molecules and have created a liquid. Now, how is that different than something that is ionically bonded? Well, we could take our sodium chloride and um, let's say it's a grain of salt. And sodium is going to exist as the sodium ion, and chlorine is going to exist as the chloride ion. And they're going to be attracted to each other because of those positive and negative charges that they have as a result of the transfer of electrons. Now, let's say that we do something really radical, like drop it in some water. The power of water has the ability to pry these two apart. And that's what happens. That's why we can say that salt dissolves in water. And it has to do with how water will surround each one of these ions, because water has some um, capabilities to do that. It's based upon polarity, something we haven't talked about yet. Uh, but that's what water does. Water surrounds each one of these ions and pries them apart. Now, even though they're separated, it's still the sodium ion and it's still the chloride. And what happens if we take the water away from them? Well, they go back to being sodium chloride. So we've done nothing by bringing them together or prying them apart. They remained in their ionic state, whether they were together or whether they were apart, unlike something that is covalently bonded, which can completely alter its structure, its makeup, its presentation to the world just by the act of sharing electrons. This is a great chart from your book that talks about how hydrogen and oxygen have a tendency to exist as molecules. So if we just look at the boiling point, the boiling point of hydrogen is a negative 253 degrees Celsius. I mean, that's below zero, way below zero. And as a hydrogen gas, it's explosive, highly volatile. And if we look at oxygen, it has a boiling point well below zero as well, also a gas. But we need it in order for there to be an explosion. So very different behaviors there. But once we create a union, a covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen and create water, look at that boiling point. Now we're 100 degrees above freezing point. Completely different. Boy, talk about a 180. And instead of it being in a gas form, now it's a liquid and it can actually be used to extinguish the flame that is caused by hydrogen and oxygen. All right, I wanna give a nod to the metallic bond.
Um, so what is the deal about a metallic bond? Well, when you have a metallic substance, keep in mind that those atoms have a tendency to release those electrons because by releasing the electrons you create stability and you leave behind a positively charged cation as a result. So when you get a bunch of these types of molecules together, what ends up happening is that you have a sea of free-floating free electrons surrounding these positively charged nuclei that are left behind as a result of the electrons dissociating from the atom itself. So let's say that we have something like aluminum. Aluminum has three electrons in its balance shell. And if we were to drop aluminum into a sample of aluminum, keep in mind that there are other aluminums that are populating this sample. And all of these electrons and all of these positively charged nuclei that are left behind are in essence going to be glued together by this sea of free floating electrons that are inherently attracted to those positively charged nuclei while at the same time being repulsed by all of the other negatively charged electrons. So it would actually organize itself in such a way so that it had each electron had maximum exposure to a nucleus while um, uh, as little exposure as possible to another electron because of you know that whole positive uh, negative attracts and same charges tend for tendency to repulse. So these these will arrange themselves in a sea of those free floating dissociated electrons and create your solid that we think of as a metal. There's a, a caveat there. Mercury has a tendency to exist as a liquid at room temperature, uh, but it still has you know, some organization to it, which is why it's got that adhesive quality, much like cohesive quality, much like um, water. So I just wanted to give you a nod about the metallic bonding. It's not an outright transfer of electrons. It's not necessarily a sharing of electrons. It's basically creating a sea of electrons that the metallic ion gets locked into because the electrons end up acting like glue. And that's why most um, metals have a tendency to be, be hard, but yet somewhat malleable. So that's our nod to the metallic bond. Formulas. Now, there is some language in your book that I want to clarify before we actually start talking about formulas. And you can take a look here and see that I have an ionically bonded compound and a covalently bonded compound. And they're different as far as how, do we, how the author refers to them as formulas. So we could write the formula for our sodium chloride as NaCl. And that's basically telling us that for every sodium, we need a chlorine. For every positive one charge of the sodium, we need a negative one charge of our chloride in order to offset it. We could write a formula for water. We could say we need two hydrogens and an oxygen to create this molecule. And both of those are formulas. They both tell us what we need in order to have um, a correct organization associated with this substance. But what they're implying is something completely different. The two are actually different despite looking the same and being written the same and following the same sort of rules. How we get there is different. So when we're talking about the covalently bonded compound that, such as water, this is referred to as a molecular formula. And that's because when things covalently bond, they form those molecules, those distinct substances that are very likely different than the constituent elements that make up the compound. So our molecular formula is more like a recipe. So just like you can take flour and eggs and chocolate and some vanilla, and butter and put it all together in a pan and create brownies, which is very different than just you know plain old cup of flour and a raw egg sitting on the counter. Um, your water is very different than the hydrogen and oxygen gases that make it up. So that's why we call it a molecular formula. Your ionically bonded substance, on the other hand, is referred to as a formula unit. And there's a reason for that. It's because when we look at salt, when you look at a grain of salt, you're not looking at one sodium ion and one chloride. You're looking at a bunch of them gathered up together, and they're arranged in such a way 
so that all of the positive ions are surrounded by negative ions and all of the negative ions are surrounded by positive ions. And depending upon the, the magnitude of the charge that each ion presents, it can require a certain number of the oppositely charged ion to offset it. So in the case of sodium, we're going to cover this more later. So if you didn't catch that on the first pass, just take a breath and say, OK, she's talking about ratios, and she's going to go into it in a little more depth in a few more slides. So basically, a formula unit is telling us about a ratio when these ions come together and form a nugget. It's a nugget that it forms. It doesn't form a distinct molecule that we could you know, pull apart and look at and say, oh, it's two of those and one of those. There's a conglomeration of sodium and chlorines that have come together to create that bit of salt. And it's not necessarily going to be 20 sodiums and 20 chlorides that do that. Um, it could be 100 of each. But the ratio is that for every positively charged sodium, you need it to be offset by a negatively charged chloride. And our one sodium, one chloride formula unit tells us that it's a one to one ratio. More on that later. So if that's a little over your head, just take a breath, file it away in a brain cell, and we'll come back to it. So how can we define a formula? Well, a formula is basically the written expression of our compound. It's how we convey to another reader what it is that we're dealing with. We can think of it as a recipe telling us how much of an atom is present in our compound, and all of this is true. Now, we have a molecular formula which tells us about covalently bonded compounds, and as we just discussed on the previous slide, this is a, a distinct um, species, different from the elements that make, that make it up as opposed to the formula units, which is telling us about ionically bonded compounds. In this scenario, your sodium ion is always going to be a sodium ion. It doesn't change by virtue of the fact that it's now next to a chloride. And chloride doesn't change by virtue of the fact that it is next to a sodium ion. They are the same, whether they are in approximation with each other or whether they are separate from each other. And that language is reflected in your book. Um, sometimes I refer to it. For the most part, I'm just simply going to say formula, just so you know. I don't necessarily make that distinction. All right, so this is two type, these are two types of formulas. What about the empirical formula and the structural formula? Well, let's go have a look at those. So what is an empirical formula? Well, we could say that an empirical formula um, are the relative is the relative number of atoms in a compound. Now, what do we mean by relative number? Well, it's kind of like a ratio, um, and it's it's taking a formula and distilling it down to its essential ratio. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at glucose. Here is glucose. Glucose has a formula of six carbons, twelve hydrogens, and six oxygens. Do you see anything there between that 6, 12, and 6? Yeah. Yeah, we could divide all of those numbers by 6, and we would have one carbon, two hydrogens, and one oxygen. But if we want to make glucose, we need 6 carbons, 12 hydrogens, and 6 oxygens. There's another type of sugar that we can have called ribose. And ribose has this formula with 5 carbons, 10 hydrogens, and 5 oxygens. What do we notice about this? Well, if we were to divide all of those numbers by 5, we would have 1 carbon to 2 hydrogens to 1 oxygen. So we have this sort of a ratio with glucose, the relationship between carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We have this sort of a relationship <clears throat> with those elements in ribose. It is the same ratio. So what we could say for both of these is that they have the same empirical formula because in both cases, the ratio is one carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen. And this happens in nature. If you want specifically glucose, you need to make sure you have six carbons. If you want ribose, you need to make sure you have five carbons. And because these are molecular compounds 
that ribose and that glucose are going to be handled differently in nature. They're, they'll be handled differently by our bodies. But they have the same empirical formula. Let's look at some more examples. So here we have water, H2O. And what we can see and what the formula tells us is that we have a 2 to 1 ratio between our hydrogens and our oxygens. Now, can we distill that down anymore? No, we can't. So we know that the formula for water is H2O. And given the ratio at its essence is 2 to 1, the empirical formula for water is also H2O. So in the case of water, its empirical formula is the same as its molecular formula. What about this guy right here? This is the hydroxide. Um, technically, it's an ion, but I'm not displaying it that way. So what do we see here? Well, we can write it OH. That works. And we can see that we have a one-to-one -one sort of ratio going on, which means that we could write this simply as OH. So here's another example where the molecular formula is the same as the empirical formula. Let's look at this guy right here. This is um, peroxide, hydrogen peroxide. And here's the formula for it. And if we were to divide everything by two, we would basically see that we have a one-to-one -one ratio between our hydrogen and our oxygen. So in this case, we could write the empirical formula as HO. We could also say OH. It doesn't really matter at this point. But we would be able to distill this one down and say that for every hydrogen, you need an oxygen. Now, if we look at all three of these different molecules, we can see that two of them have the same empirical formula. And it would be our hydroxide and our hydrogen peroxide. Very different substances behave very different in our bodies, particularly, but they have the same formula. Whereas water doesn't match these. So this is an example of being able to tease out empirical formula uh, versus um, it being the same as its um, molecular formula, or even its, um, it's just its formula in general. So I'm getting distracted with myself. What I'm trying to say here is uh, usually about this time in a classroom, someone says, why do we even study this? Well, the reason why is this. When early scientists didn't know what they had, they would take a substance and they would distill it down to its essence. They would measure it, they would weigh it, they would do everything that they had the capacity to do, but essentially they had to degrade it through some sort of chemical process to figure out what was in it. So they would take glucose, for example, and they would weigh it and figure out what its molecular weight was and, and you know do all the calculations they knew to do. And then they would find a way to degrade it so that they could see, oh, well, it's carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, and it has these ratios. And then they could do some highfalutin math and say, well, we know that it weighs this much. So if we could correlate its empirical formula the weight of that with the weight that it, it really is, then we could figure out what its molecular formula is. And that's what they did. So think if you were a, a, a scientist, didn't have a lot of sophisticated tools, and you degraded ribose, maybe to your surprise, you're like, wow, this is also one carbon, two hydrogens, and one oxygen. But when I weigh it, it weighs differently. And then if I do my fa highfalutin fancy calculation, I figure out that this, is one, this species has five carbons, 10 hydrogens, five oxygens. So the reason why we even have empirical formula is because what our early forefathers and foremothers were doing in the chemistry labs were degrading substances down to their empirical formulas and then calculating back um, in molecular weights in order to come up with the formula of the substance. So that's where that comes from. And here we are at the structural formula. And you might be asking yourself, what is a structural formula? Well, you've been looking at it all throughout this lecture. These are basically those pictures that have the lines that show how the atoms are connected together. So here's the structural formula for water. Here it is for the hydroxide ion, and here it is for hydrogen peroxide. 
We also saw it when we looked at glucose and ribose. Now, you might not be familiar with these ring structures, so let me just clue you in. I'm not going to belabor this point, but I don't want you to feel like you've missed something. You really haven't. But at each one of these corners, there's a carbon. There'd be actually a carbon and a hydrogen. And there's a carbon and a hydrogen here, and then there's one down here, and another one here, and another one here. So this is how we get six carbons out of our um, sugar molecule. But you can see that it's starting to get really congested if you include all of those carbons there. So this is a shorthand notation in the structural formula formatting that eliminates um, a carbon and a hydrogen at each one of those corners. Because you can imagine if I included the hydrogens, it would really be crazy. Because remember, this thing has 12 hydrogens to it. And the same thing is true with ribose. We would have these four carbons in the circle also with an additional hydrogen. But it's much simpler just to write it in this way. So this is a, a, a system of writing hydrocarbons that leaves off a lot of redundant carbon and hydrogens because the name hydrocarbon pretty much implies that you're dealing with large molecules that are comprised of hydrogens and carbons. So, But these are all examples of structural formulas. So um, now you have a name to everything that you've been seeing. We also use models to demonstrate the structure of atoms, and there's a couple of different ones. For example, you have the space filling model, and this shows you the, the real estate that each atom takes up in a molecule. Um, and we can see the red guy here is pretty much the real estate hog, and that would be oxygen. Oxygen has a tendency to do that. And the two white ones are hydrogen. They're kind of small, so they take up a little bit less space. Another type of model, the one that we would use if we were on campus and in uh, the, the lab, is the ball and stick model. And um, it, it also represents the oxygen and the hydrogens. These are two representations using models of water, H2O, where the uh, two H's are white and the oxygen is the, the red ball. So, um, yeah, you can use these these models as well. So if you're perusing around on the internet and you see these two, um, they are color coded. There is uh, something that's been agreed to pretty much across all standards that says that oxygen is red and hydrogens are white or this light gray and and um, uh, carbon is black. So you'll see these colors kind of repeated throughout. Uh, you're not required to memorize these things, but I do want you to have an understanding of what it is you're looking at when you get on the internet and you start doing some research. Whether it's the image on the left or the image on the right, they mean the same thing. And um, it would, it, and here they are. So Gilbert Newton Lewis was a scientist, and um, he was running around with all the greats that we've studied so far, like Schrodinger and uh, Heisenberg and all of those fellas. And he, he, he's actually from Haverhill, Mass. And he went to um, a conference one time, and he had a bunch of his notes because he was working on something. And he sat down with somebody, I don't remember who, and he was showing somebody his notes on this work that he was doing on this concept. And the person said, whoa, 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 dude, what are these drawings? And Gilbert didn't know it, but he had created this shorthand where he took the valence electrons of atoms and he used the arrangements um, he represented them by dots, and he was able to use this little configuration to fairly accurately predict how atoms come together to form molecules and what those shapes might look like. So even though he thought he was working on this other really great work, and he might have been, it was actually overshadowed by this shorthand and these drawings that he was coming up with. And it became known as the Lewis model. And it's a very powerful model because it allows us to predict bonding patterns and the geometry of molecules. Now, this is important because molecules don't exist as two-dimensional structures. They have three dimensions, just like you and I. You know, the nose sticks off of our face and our ears stick out and, you know, our shoulders are broad and 
You know, we have all of this dimension. We take up three dimensions. Molecules do the same thing. And understanding how they come together, we can make some predictions about their functionality. And with Lewis's model, we were able to do that. So Lewis was able to predict the geometry of all three of these molecules that we see here, and to do so with amazing accuracy, even though it was a very simple, uh, a simple approach. It has its limitations, but for us, it's going to be very handy because it's a great tool to help Chemistry 1 students understand what's happening at the molecular level, how these things come together. And we're going to be looking at it um, in some depth later on in the chapter. So let's take a look and see what Lewis was doing with the elements, how it was that he was <clears throat> writing their valence electrons. So what did it look like? Well, we're going to take a look at just the main group elements. So elements that live somewhere between 1a and 8a. So let's start with hydrogen. Hydrogen has one proton, one neutron, one electron. And that one electron lives in the only orbital that it has, which would be its valence orbital. So we would give it one dot. Helium is next in the line of elements. It has two electrons. We know that because it has two protons. But by filling up that first orbital, it has completed its valence, and so we keep it tucked away over here in the eighth column, along with all the rest of the noble gases. All the noble gases have uh, full valence orbitals, so they have, which predicts their behavior. They have a tendency to be non-reactive as a result of that. They're not looking to gain electrons. They're not looking to lose electrons. They're happy with the number that they have. Now, the third element is going to be lithium. And lithium has three protons, three neutrons, three electrons. Two of those electrons live in the first orbital. And then it has one electron that lives in its valence orbital. And we would draw its Lewis dot like this. Seen a pattern there? Beryllium is the next player. It has four electrons. Two of them live in a valence. We would give it two dots. Boron is the next player. It lives in column 3A. How many dots do you think boron gets? It gets three dots. It has three electrons in its valence. Carbon has four electrons. It gets four dots. Nitrogen gets five dots. Oxygen gets six dots. Fluorine gets seven. Neon gets eight. For main group elements, the column that it lives in can accurately predict the number of valence electrons. And Lewis took that information and he just started dropping in dots. And he, you can see he started off you know, to the right there on the, on the side. And then he gave a dot up at the top. And then he gave a dot to the left. And then he gave a dot down to the bottom. And when he put four dots, he started over. And he started over until he went around twice. And by the time he went around twice, as what we see here in neon, he had given that electron eight, or are they given that atom eight valence electrons? Eight valence electrons is a full valence. And now it's got an octet. Octet means eight. So with this eight, we have now completed our valence shell and then we've created a very stable atom as a result. What do you think the elements in the third row of the periodic table look like? They look a lot like the ones that preceded them. If you're, a col if you're in column 1a, you get one dot. Column 2a, two dots. If you're in column 6a, you get six dots. And what about potassium and calcium? Well, they're the last of the elements that we're going to look at because the next one that would show up would actually be a transition metal, and I don't really want to go there yet. But we can work with these in order to educate ourselves about Lewis's model and be able to make some predictions on our own how um, elements come together to create molecules. So let's do that. All right, so we're just going to do a rough pass at a couple of simple molecules just to demonstrate the little bit of knowledge that we've gained with regard to what Lewis was doing. So let's say that we wanted to try to see if we could accurately predict how carbon and hydrogen would come together and form CH4, which is the methane molecule.
Well, we can start with carbon. And for the Lewis dot for carbon, it gets those four uh, electrons in its valence orbitals, like that. And we could draw a hydrogen that looks like this. Now, at this point, usually people say, well, does the dot always have to be in one place? No, it doesn't. So we could draw one hydrogen like this and maybe put the dot on the bottom of another hydrogen and then put this dot off to the side and then put this last dot off to that side. It doesn't really matter as long as you show that hydrogen gets one dot, then you're all set. So the way Lewis would do this is he would say, well, um, hydrogen can only accept one more dot and then it's full, which means that hydrogen can only bond with one thing. So I have to decide who's going to be in the center. I can't put hydrogen in the center. Hydrogen always has to be on the outside so that it can carefully bond with only one thing and not leave anybody hanging. So I'm going to start with my carbon as my central atom. Now the whole purpose of carbon bonding with anything is that it's trying to achieve an octet. That's the whole purpose of a covalent bond, is to share electrons with enough elements that somebody like carbon gets an octet. So we can take one of these hydrogens and drop it in right there. And now carbon has gained, at least part-time, an extra electron. And we can drop another hydrogen right there. Oh, and look, it's now gained a second electron, at least part-time. And we can drop in another hydrogen there and the last hydrogen there. And what we've essentially done is said that if carbon can share the electrons of four hydrogens, carbon can achieve an octet. And, and an octet is a lower energy state than just carbon hanging out with its four electrons looking for something to do. And as a result of this, Mother Nature drives this into existence more readily than it does carbon just hanging out by itself. Now, this is what Lewis model would say could happen. And to clean this up, we could then take this and do a structural formula. We could draw a diagram. And wherever there are two electrons between two atoms, we could replace it with a line. So we can have it look like this. So from the Lewis model, we're able to easily convert that into our structural formulas, just in case you're ever wondering where those structural formulas came from. There you go. So let's say that we wanted to do the same thing with water. Well, let's just bring up water and um, water. Let's bring up oxygen. And oxygen is a group 6A element. How many dots is it going to get? Well, it's going to get six. So we're going to put one here, and then number two there, and number three there, and number four there, and we're done with our four sides. And so we start over. There's number five, and then there's number six, and we're done. So we've got the six dots of our oxygen put in place. And we've already worked with hydrogen, so I'm just going to drop them right here and right there. Well, we've already learned that hydrogen can only bond with one other element, so it's always going to be on the end. We call hydrogen hydrogens the terminal um, elements because they typically hang out on the periphery of a molecule because they can only bond with one other thing. So we're going to put our oxygen right here in the center, and we're going to drop in our two hydrogens right there and right there. Oh, and look at what's happened to oxygen. Oxygen now has an octet. By sharing two electrons with two different hydrogens, it now has its octet. This is a very stable configuration. Now you might notice that oxygen was able to achieve this octet because it has two of its own electrons right here paired up. We have a name for this. These are called lone pair electrons. They're not bonded with anybody else, but they serve a purpose. They help create this octet, so we leave them there. And with what we did on the previous slide with uh, our methane, we can replace the the where two electrons are being shared by two atoms with a straight line. So if we recreate what we have up here and drop in a line, we can drop in a line with this hydrogen. That line represents two electrons. And then drop in a line here. That line represents two 
electrons. I think I might have said that wrong just a minute ago. Two electrons. So each line represents two electrons. And in this way, Lewis accurately predicts that molecule, that the water molecule is kind of shaped like this. Now there's a little bit more information about the influence that these lone pairs are exerting. We're not going to get into this right now, but by leaving them this way, Lewis was accurate to do so, and that is why we always show oxygen kind of up and the uh, hydrogen's angled down. It has to do with those lone pairs. So again, it was an accurate prediction, and um, it holds true. Nice tool. So let's kind of recap and rehash what we just worked through uh, in the previous uh, several slides. So if we look at the Lewis model, what Lewis did and what we're doing is we're representing those balanced electrons as dots, we're taking the symbol of our element, taking a look at where it lives in the periodic table, and figuring out how many valence electrons it has, and then um, filling them in as dots around the element's symbol. The Lewis electron dot structures, also called Lewis structures, then help us predict the structural formula by looking at how the valence electrons interact. So Lewis dot structures, Lewis structures, lead the way, pave the way to get us to the structural formulas. And that's where we have the symbols and the lines and it shows all the connectivity. Lewis structures focus on valence electrons because chemical bonding, chemical reactions are driven by those valence electrons. It's through the transfer or the sharing of valence electrons that we get some sort of a reaction happening between atoms. So this is basically um, things that we've known, but Lewis's uh, dots put it all together for us really nicely. Now, as we saw with methane and with water, the Lewis model can um, beautifully illustrate covalently bonded molecules. All right, that's great. But what about ionically bonded um, compounds? Well, it can be used also to illustrate simple ionic compounds, things that aren't just, you know, real elaborate. So yeah, Lewis can make some pretty good predictions about what's happening with those electrons too. So let's see. They can be used to represent the transfer of electrons from a metal to a non-metal. That would be an example of a simple ionic compound. And the resulting ions that are attracted to each other as a result of that. So let's take a look at our friend potassium. Now here we have the electron configuration of potassium. Potassium lives in the fourth row. Fourth row means it's going to have four orbitals. It has a... Um, an atomic number of 19, which means that we need to place 19 electrons somewhere. So we fill up the first orbital with two electrons. We fill up the second orbital with eight electrons, that's 10. We fill up the 3s and the 3p orbital with another eight, that gives us 18. And then that last electron is going to live in the 4s subshell. Now, with that one electron being out there, we could draw the Lewis dot so that it looks like that. Oh, look how easy that is. So our friend potassium, yeah, it lives in the first column. It gets that one dot. What can we predict based upon what we know? Well, we can predict that that potassium is going to shed that one electron out there and that we can rewrite its electron configuration so that it looks like this. So we basically eliminated the 4s subshell. Technically, it's still there, but there's nothing living in it. And look at what we leave behind. What we leave behind is a full 3s and 3p subshell. And now we have an octet. By casting off that one rogue child electron, potassium, in essence, has capitalized on the preceding um, orbital that's full and thereby has given itself an octet. And Lewis helps us predict that this is what's happening. And he's right.
So you've heard me mention the octet rule a few times. So what is the octet rule? Well, in short, the octet rule basically says that an element will undergo the gain of electrons, the loss of electrons, or the sharing of electrons in order to get eight electrons in its outer orbital. And when it does that, when it gets those eight electrons, it's 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 moving towards a noble gas-like configuration. And if we look at this slide, the second bullet says non-metal period two elements must obey the octet rule. Um, well, that's kind of true for just about everybody. They're going to they're going to try to obey that octet rule, whether they're gaining electrons, whether they're losing electrons, or whether they're sharing electrons. Now, there's a few exceptions to that. Um, and that might be what the author of this slide, I didn't write this slide, I actually borrowed it from another um, another presentation, but I thought it was pretty good. Uh, but that's what they're trying to say. So as we saw with our friend potassium, I mean, it's a big element. It's got 19 electrons in it. When it casts off that one electron that's hanging out there, what does its electron configuration look like? Well, if you go back and look at it, you'll see that it looks like argon. And argon is the noble gas that is just right before potassium in the periodic chart. If we were to go one beyond potassium and look at calcium, calcium is going to cast off two electrons. When calcium casts off two electrons, its electron configuration is going to look a lot like argon. So I challenge you to play with this a little bit. Like look at, go back and look at potassium. Go back and look at calcium. And then go look at um, oxygen and fluorine and see what's happening there. Oxygen and fluorine will move to the noble gas that's at the end of that row, which is neon. So play with this on your own and see what I'm talking about and get that locked into your head so you can kind of see what's happening. And the reason why it's going to that octet, because it's stable, right? Now there's going to be exceptions to this rule. That tends to be the nature of chemistry. Chemistry says this is the rule and here's the 25 exceptions to it. And this is no different. These exceptions will go in, uh, like it's going to talk about expanded octets. I don't want to talk about expanded octets right now. Um, again, file this away in a brain cell somewhere and know that we're going to come back to it and I will make this very simple for you to understand. This is another slide that deals with the octet rule and the exceptions to that rule. Now these exceptions are going to deal with those elements that are so small that in order for them to have a full valence shell, they're talking about um, the first one, the 1s. So we're looking at hydrogen. The way hydrogen gets a full valence shell is that it, it ends up taking on um, sharing an electron with another hydrogen so that it ends up getting two electrons in that valence shell, right? Um, and in that case, it doesn't have an octet, it has a duet. And the duet is as big as it can get. Lithium, on the other hand, has one more electron than helium does. So lithium will cast off that one electron, leaving behind two electrons in what is now the outer valence shell and creating stability. Beryllium does the same thing, and so does boron. So these that are really small, instead of moving towards an octet, they're basically moving towards a duet. So this is an, another exception. This is an easy exception, uh, which is why I'm going ahead and covering it. We'll talk about it again off and on throughout the chapter as we look at what these characters are doing. Um, but yeah, the, they're moving towards a duet as opposed to the octet. Here's a very nice diagram from your book that talks about the different ways that we can represent a compound. So if we start in the far left, we can just give it a name. Now we haven't talked about how to name molecules yet, and there are rules depending upon the type of compound you're talking about. And then there are some names that are old names that have stuck around. And then there are some names that are new because they've created these um, naming structures. 
and uh, you'll see multiple names for the same compound. Fortunately, we don't do a great deal of that in this class, uh, but they're out there. So it's possible that you could see two names for a compound, and it's because they pro most likely have held on to the old name after they created the naming conventions. The other way to represent a compound is through that empirical formula, which is um, the recipe distilled down to its lowest ratio of elements. The other way is through the molecular formula. We're looking at all molecules here. And then from Lewis dot, we get the structural formula. And then if we were in the position to have models where we could stick you know, uh, balls on sticks, we could have the ball and stick model. Or if we had the space filling models, then we could use that. So this is a way of kind of putting all of these different ways of representing compounds together on a single chart. This slide goes into a little bit of summary of the different formulas that we've discussed. So for example, the, structure, the structural formula is basically a picture that gives you the type and actual number of arrangements of atoms in a molecule. So this is a visual picture of what's happening. The molecular uh, formula um, tells you the, the number of atoms in the compound, but it doesn't tell you how they're arranged, and that can be important. And then you have the empirical formula, which actually communicates the least amount of information because all it conveys is the simplest whole number um, relative relationship or ratio between the elements that make up the compound. But these are the different formulas that we've talked about. And this might not be a bad uh, thing to have at your disposal if you want to remind yourself what each one of these is. Now we've already talked about ionic compounds and covalent compounds, but there's a little bit more I want you to have a knowledge of when it comes to ionic compounds and what's happening there. And this is a great uh, diagram from your book. So we can see what metals and nonmetals look like. They tend to create these very geometric structures, and we call these lattices. And it's basically your positive ions being surrounded by your negative ions and your negative ions being surrounded by your positive ions. And that's completely different than the molecule of water that you see next door. Your molecule is a distinct species, very different than the atoms that make it up. Because remember, it's uh, gas atoms that actually make up liquid water. And the form that, that these can take. Now, you see in their ice cubes, and they're ice cubes because that was the shape that the water went into when it froze. I mean, water will freeze in any shape. Um, but yeah, so let's take a look and see what's actually happening with these ionic bonds and, and the shape and the relationship and all that sort of stuff. So as we've said previously, ionic bonds occur between metals and nonmetals, and it involves the transfer of electrons from one atom to another. And when a metal interacts with a nonmetal, it can transfer one or more of its electrons to the nonmetal. And by doing that, the metal becomes the cation, the positively charged ion, and the nonmetal becomes the anion. Now, we've discussed all of this previously. Hopefully, this seems like old news. But there it is. So let's keep going. So we've talked about how we create our cations and we create our anions. And so now we have two oppositely charged ions. And these oppositely charged ions will attract one another by the electrostatic forces due to those charges. And as a result, we get the ionic bond. Now, the result is an ionic compound, which in the solid phase is composed of the lattice that we saw which is basically alternating arrangements of positively charged particles being surrounded by negatively charged particles and negatively charged particles being surrounded by positively charged particles. That is the nature of a lattice. So here is the lattice for sodium chloride. 
And what we see here is that you have a sodium and you have a chlorine. And you can take a look and see that each green sodium is surrounded by purple um, uh, purple sodiums, and that each purple sodium is in turn surrounded by green chlorines. We can also see that for each sodium, there is a chlorine that offsets it. Each sodium brings to the table a positive one charge, and each chlorine brings a negative one charge. And when we write the formula for it, we're, we're basically expressing that it takes one positively charged sodium to offset one negatively charged chlorine. It's a ratio of one to one, and we can write that formula as NaCl. But what about when you have something like this mess over here on the right? What the heck is that? Well, this is an example of the interaction between magnesium ions and um, phosphide ions. So this is not a one-to-one -one reaction. What we see happening here is that it actually takes three magnesiums to offset the charge presented by two phosphates. So this is not as neat and tidy as what we see happening with sodium chloride because of this 3 to 2 ratio that needs to take place in order for this lattice to be formed. Now this is a little bit more complex than what we needed to go, get into in this chapter, but I present it here because in order to understand the beauty of sodium chloride, you need to understand something not so beautiful, like the interaction and the ratios between magnesium and the phosphite. So there's a little bit about that. We're going to get into this a little bit more when we start writing out uh, the formulas for compounds. We're going to need to understand what's actually happening here, which is also another reason why I introduced it at this point. Now we started this entire chapter off asking the question, why do atoms form bonds? And we can certainly ask that question right here. Why do ions form bonds? And intuitively, we might be able to say, well, because positive and negative attract. But does it really drive down energy? Because that's the answer. Does it really lower energy? Well, we can introduce some new information and pull some old information up from the past and prove to ourselves that, yes, this is in fact what happens. So let's do that. So let's take our friend here, sodium. Now, in order to get that little plus sign in the superscript, in order to make sodium an ion, the thing that we have to do is we have to pry an electron loose. And in order to do that, it does take some energy. In fact, it takes a positive input of 496 kilojoules per mole of sodium to create a mole of sodium ions. So it takes some effort to pry off those electrons. Now, what about making this ion? Well, it doesn't take a great deal of energy. Actually, it doesn't take any energy at all for that rogue electron that we pried loose from sodium to find its way and make itself at home in chlorine. In fact, when we do that, chlorine releases energy as a result of that. It creates that much stability that chlorine actually reduces its energy overall, and it releases a negative 349 kilojoules per mole of chlorine molecules. Now, if we were to put sodium and chlorine together, we would have to take into account the amount of energy that it took to create each one of those ions. And if we just look at that and put it in a formula, well, we could add the energy that it took to pry off the electrons from sodium, and the energy that chlorine released as a result of having those electrons show up and make themselves at, at home, and we could see that we end up with a much lower energy of positive 147 kilojoules. But although it's lower for sodium, it's still pretty high for chlorine. So why would chlorine be inclined to do that if it's still higher than the energy release that chlorine experiences when that electron finds its home there. Well, it has to do with this right here, Coulomb's Law. Now, we didn't work with Coulomb's Law other than to understand it. And if you remember, Coulomb's Law basically gave us words to describe what happens when particles of the same charge come together or move apart, and when particles of differing charge 
come together and move apart. Now, intuitively, if you've ever played with magnets, you know that when you have the ends of the magnet that are the same come together, it takes a lot of effort to get those ends to come apart. But the further away those, those same charged ends are, the easier it gets to deal with those two magnets. That's one of the things that Coulomb's Law says. Coulomb's Law says that the energy between similar, similarly charged particles decreases as those particles move apart. So one of the things that's happening with sodium and chlorine as they become their ions is that they're going to repulse each other in order to reduce energy. So some of that positive 147 is going to get reduced by these ions instinctively moving away from each other, being repelled away from each other. So that's one thing that's going to happen. And that's dealing with similarly charged particles. Now what happens when we introduce the sodium ion and the chlorine ion together? Now we're talking about particles that have differing charge. And Coulomb's Law says that the energy between unlike charged particles becomes even more negative as they move close together. So here we have two scenarios where we can decrease energy. We can move our similarly charged particles apart and we can move our different, differently charged particles together. And that's what happens when we take ions of sodium and ions of chlorine and put them together. Our sodiums will move apart, thereby lowering energy, thereby siphoning off some of that positive 147 kilojoules per mole. And then chlorines will move in as a result, thereby siphoning off the rest of that energy that was left over from the positive 147 kilojoules per mole. So it takes the understanding of two things in order for us to fully explain why ionic bonds come together and why they're so powerful. All right, all of that last stuff kind of got heady. You know, whenever you start talking about Coulomb's Law, you're talking about highfalutin math and things that get kind of con complicated. Let's talk about how we would actually come up with an ionic formula. That gets pretty simple. So let's bring up our friend sodium and our friend chloride. Now, when we're talking about the ions, the thing that we're going to be concerned with are those charges that we see written in the superscript. So every time sodium brings, um, comes to the table, it's going to bring with it a positive one charge. And every time chloride shows up, it's going to bring with it a negative one charge. Now, if we add positive one and negative one together, what do we get? We get zero. So when we have a scenario where you have a positive one charge and a negative one charge in equal amounts, you basically have created a neutral compound. And this is what we have when we have one sodium and one chlorine showing up. So the way that we would want to express this about this ionic formula is like this. One sodium, one chlorine. Our ratio is one to one. That keeps everything neutral, and we love that. Isn't that simple? Let's try another one. What happens if we have lithium and oxygen? Well, the first thing you notice is that oxygen doesn't have a negative one. It has a negative two. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is, is that when lithium shows up in its ionic form, it brings with it a positive one charge. And when oxygen shows up in its ion char a form, it brings with it a negative two charge. Now, if we add those together, in this case, we don't get zero, which means that if we leave it just like this, what we're getting is non-neutral. And ions don't like to be non-neutral. They want to be neutral. So we have to ask ourselves, how can we massage lithium and oxygen in order to make their relationship neutral? Well, it's not really that complicated. If we simple, simply double the amount of lithiums that we have, then we can uh, double the amount of positive charge, which will offset the negative charge that oxygen brings, and then we end up with something that is now neutral. So what that means is, is that we need two lithiums for every one oxygen. Now, how are we going to write that in our formula? Well, it's not really that hard. You would put that two in the bottom in the subscript 
after lithium. And this tells our readers that, yeah, we got lithium. We need two of them. And yeah, we've got oxygen. We only need one. Now, you'll notice that we didn't stipulate the one. By virtue of the fact that we have written it there, that means we have one. If you need more than one, then you need to give it the number. You need to go ahead and assign it the number, even if it's two. You need to let, you need to let the reader know that that's the case. Let's take a look at another one. Let's look at calcium and let's look at chlorine. So we know that calcium will bring with it a positive 2 every time it shows up. And then every time chlorine shows up, it's going to bring with it a negative 1. And we've kind of been down this path before, sort of. And we know that if we add these together, we're going to end up with something that is not neutral. But we can fix that if we double the negative 1 charge, which means that we need two chlorines, right? When we have two chlorines, then we can now have a neutral compound. And we like neutral. Our, our ionic formulas want to be neutral. And in order to convey this to our reader, we would say, yeah, we're going to need one calcium, and we're going to need two chlorines, and we will be sure to write that two in the subscript after our chlorine, stipulating that we need two of them. How's that? that looks kind of simple. All right, good. So let's try our hands at something a little bit more challenging. So let's say we have magnesium and phosphide. Well, we know that every time magnesium shows up, it's going to bring with it a positive 2 charge. And when the phosphide shows up, it's going to bring a negative 3. And we can already see that these are not going to add up to 0. So let's use our trick where we double one of them. And we end up with a positive uh, 4 and a negative 3. And we still haven't solved our problem. So what does that mean? Well, it means we can mess around with this until we stumble across the right answer. Or if you happen to be some sort of a savant and recognize that two and three have something in common. So if we were to double the three and triple the two, we could actually come up with a positive six and a negative six. And that would give us our neutral that we're seeking, right? Then we would have to communicate that we need three magnesiums and two phosphides. And then we could put that in a formula that looks like this. Magnesium 3, phosphate 2. This is a little bit of work. So we might ask ourselves, is there a simpler way? And the answer is yes. So let's find that simpler way. Okay, so we've rewritten our union of magnesium and phosphide. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to look up here in the superscript of magnesium, where I have this positive 2, and I'm going to take that 2. And I'm not going to worry about the positive. I'm not even going to worry about the negative. I'm just going to take the value, 2. And in a minute, I'm going to write it in the subscript of the phosphide. And then for phosphide, I'm going to take that value of its charge. I'm not going to worry about the positive or the negative, just the value, which is the 3. And then I'm, in a minute, going to write it over here in the subscript for magnesium. And when I do this, I get my formula. How about that? Let's try another one and see what happens. Here we have aluminum and we have chloride. So we want to take the value of what's in the superscript for aluminum, and we're going to want to put it in the subscript for our chlorine. And then we're going to take the value of what's in our superscript of our chlorine. Now, we didn't write the 1, but the 1 is implied. And we're going to put that in the subscript for aluminum. So when we write this formula, it's going to be AlCl3. And this, my friends, is what I call the old red and blue switcheroo. And it works every time. And once you see it, you can never not see it. So here it is. Okay, now that we know how we can put these things together and make them neutral, 
Is there a way for us to name these things that we create? And yes, there is. There are, there are naming conventions. We're going to look at them. And the title of this slide is Binary Ionic Compound Naming. What is a binary ionic compound? Well, bi means two. And a binary ionic compound involves two ions in a compound. So we're looking at um, like sodium and chlorine put together as ions and creating something. In fact, that may be the first thing that we do right here, sodium. All right, so how do we name these in their ion states? That's really the first question that we need to ask. How do we name the sodium ion? How do we name the chlorine ion? Well, naming a cation, naming a positively charged ion is very simple. You take the name of the element and you add ion to it. So the sodium ion is called the sodium ion. Naming a, a, an anion is a little bit more complex, not by much. Just takes an extra little something something. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take the root name of chlorine, which is chlor, and instead of calling it chlorine and adding the I-N-E, we're going to add an I-D-E so that it becomes chloride. So now we know how to name a cation. We know how to name an anion. To name a cation, you just take the name of the element and add ion to it. To name a negatively charged particle, an anion, you take the root name and add "-ied". That's it. So simple. Now, how do we uh, put it together to make, the, uh, make a, the name of our compound? Well, we get rid of the ion, and then we put the other two pieces together, and we have sodium chloride. Now, looking at the sodium and looking at the chloride, we can put the formula together pretty easy because we have a positive one, negative one, they cancel each other out. So we can actually write the formula right here and we can call this sodium chloride. So this is putting together a lot of pieces of things that we've learned. Is any of this particularly hard? It's not particularly hard, it's just kind of keeping it straight. So let's do another one. Help us keep it straight. How about potassium and iodine? Well, I've jumped the gun here, hit the spacebar too soon, and potassium is my positively charged ion, so we're going to call it the potassium ion, but what about this I? Who is the I? Well, if we were to pluck it off the periodic table, it would be iodine. Root word is iode. And like we did for chlorine, we're going to add that IDE, iodide. Get rid of the ion, put the two together, potassium iodide. Can we come up with the formula for potassium iodide right here on the spot? Take a look. Yeah, we sure can. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, and it is Ki. I know that looks funny, but it's actually Ki, potassium iodide. All right, let's do another one. Let's do magnesium. Oh, we're already thinking this may be hard. And of course it is. We're going to do this guy. So what's the name of our magnesium cation? Magnesium ion. All right. The P. The P is phosphorus. What do you think the root word is for phosphorus? Well, you can mess around with it. And if you came up with something like phosph, you did good. And phosphide tends to just kind of roll off the tongue. So there you go. So I'm going to stop right here and address something. What if you get to an exam and I ask you to spell this out and you misspell it? Like maybe you put phosphoide. Um, I'll give you credit for that because there's not a real strict naming convention for this. Um, we could do enough of these that we could find all the weird ones. But if you do your best and you give me that eyed, that tells me that you understand. Um, and that's what I'm looking for. So there's that. All right, so what do we do next? We've, we've named our cation, we named our anion, we get rid of the ion, and then we smush everything together when we have magnesium phosphide. Using the old red and blue switcheroo, what's the formula going to be? Well, hopefully you said three magnesium and two phosphides, because that's what it is. So this is how you deal with a cation and an anion coming together to form an ionic compound, how you name them, and even how you create the formulas.
So we're starting to build on our knowledge at this point. It's getting exciting. So far, everything that we've been dealing with, all of the uh, metals and nonmetals, have come from what we would call type 1 ions. Type 1 ions, I know it's not listed here on the slide anywhere, but the type 1 ions create ions predictably. We know that sodium is always going to have a positive 1 charge, and that magnesium is always going to have a positive 2 charge. But there are elements in the periodic table, most of which live in the transitional element region. That's that dippy any part in the periodic table that we haven't really talked about much yet. There are metals that live there that can form more than one ion. And there are reasons for that. We don't need to talk about them right now. What you need to know is that there are elements in the dippy any region of the periodic table, those transition metals, that can form ions that have different charges. And we call those type 2 ions. The ones that can form predictable charge, like our sodium, our magnesium, our potassium, chlorine, all of those are type 1s. Type 2s, these are kind of funny. So let's look at some type 2s. These are some examples of type 2. So the first one is copper. We have copper that can have a positive 1 charge. We have copper that can have a positive 2 charge. Now, how do we convey to our reader that we're talking about the copper with the positive 1 charge versus the copper with the positive 2 charge? That's actually pretty simple. We would say copper, and if it's the one that has the positive 1 charge, we would put a Roman numeral 1 in parentheses after it. If we were talking about copper with the positive 2 charge, we would put copper with the Roman numerals 2 after it. How's that for simple? So let's look at the next one, Fe. That stands for iron. So what would you name the first one? Iron with a positive 2 charge. Well, hopefully you would call it iron 2. And the one below it with a, with a positive 3 charge, you would call it iron 3. Below this, we have Pb. Pb does not stand for peanut butter. It stands for lead. So we have lead with a positive 2 charge, lead with a positive 4 charge. And if you said we could name the first one lead 2 and the second one lead 4, you're absolutely correct. Now, at this point, there is no need for you to panic over these Roman numerals because we're only going to go as high as 4. And that's what 4 looks like right there. It is the 1 and the, the V sign. V is actually 5, and then the Roman numeral structure, if the small number comes before the large number, then it's subtracted from it, and that's how you get the 4. All right, so this is the, the naming protocol that I'm going to use in this class. Now, this is a fairly new naming convention. There is an old one that is still in use. You'll see it in, um, in articles. Um, you may even still see it in textbooks. So I'm going to introduce it to you so that you're not completely befuddled when you encounter it. Now, the abbreviation CU actually stands for the Latin name of copper, which is cuprum. And in the old style of naming these two ions, we would use the endings OUS and IC. So the element that had the lesser charge would be cuprous, and the element with the larger charge would be cupric. Now, this is great. It tells us that one has a greater charge and one has a lesser charge, but what it doesn't tell us is what that charge is. And that could be useful if you don't have a chart handy and can't look this stuff up. And that is the flaw in the us and the ick endings. So if we look at our friend iron, well, clearly iron has some other name, which is what that Fe stands for. Its Latin name is ferrum. So iron 2, if you guessed, would be ferrous, iron 3 would be ferric. Now I said a minute ago PB does not stand for peanut butter, it stands for something that is oh so much better. It stands for plum bum. <laughs> plum bum. I love that. I'm going to name my next cat plum bum. Um, so we would give the same endings to plum bum. So and you accurately predicted it would be plumbus and plumbic. So this is the old style naming. Um, 
it lets you know greater than, less than, doesn't let you know the number. I actually like to say copper and iron and lead, two, four, three, whatever it is. I actually like that. So this is what we'll be using moving forward, just so you know. So let's name some binary ionic compounds using the type 2 ions. So here's copper and here's chlorine. And we can see copper is going to bring with it that positive 2 charge. So we're going to call it the copper 2 ion. And how do we name this chlorine ion? Chlor and ide. Yay! All right, this is the only deviation that we really needed to take was putting that 2 after copper. We're going to get rid of the ion just like we did before, and then we're going to call it copper 2 chloride. Just that simple. And can we come up with a formula for copper 2 chloride? Well, if we know how to use red and blue switcheroo, indeed we can. We need one copper and two chlorines, and we are done. Let's try another one. All right, here we have lead, and we have S. S, we're going to have to look up S. But let's do with lead for a moment. So we have lead with a positive uh, 4 charge. What are we going to call it? Well, we're going to call it lead 4 ion. All right, S. Hopefully you can take a minute and look up S in the periodic table. S does not stand for sodium. S stands for sulfur. There's a couple of ways to spell sulfur. I'm going to use the one with an F. So the root word for sulfur, the root part of that word is going to be sulf. So it would be sulfide. I'm going to get rid of the ion, and you got it, lead for sulfide. Now, can we come up with a formula for lead for lead for sulfide? We sure can, and we might, by using red and blue switcheroo, say that it looks like this. But what we're talking about here is not a molecular formula, because we don't need two leads for every four sulfurs. We don't need that. Remember, this is a ratio, and they're all kind of stacked around each other. So what we want to do in the case of these ionic compounds, when we see things that can be divided out, like two can be divided into two and two can be divided into four, we don't want to use it like this. We actually want to do that division and make it as simple as we can and say PBS2, one lead for every two sulfide ions. Okay? Just an extra little something you got to think about, but it's not hard. Just paying attention to that level of detail. Let's do another one. Here we have zinc and we have oxygen. And you may have already noticed they're both two, right? I hope your wheels are turning because we're not going to put twos in the subscripts. I'll just tell you that right now. All right, but let's go ahead and name it. So what are we going to call zinc? Well, we're dealing with type 2 ions, so guess what we're going to call zinc? You could look it up on a chart if you wanted, but zinc is going to be zinc 2 ion. What are we going to call this oxygen with this negative self? Well, it's got the root word of ox. We're going to add that I to it. Oxide. You've heard that before. Well, here it is. This is how it gets that name. We're going to get rid of the ion, and we're going to name it zinc oxide. Hey, how about that? Yeah, this zinc oxide is that white stuff you put on your nose if you're a lifeguard to keep your nose from burning. There it is. And what's the formula for it? It's not going to be two zincs and two oxygens, is it? Nope. It's simply going to be one zinc and one oxygen. All right. Anything particularly hard here? There's no logarithms. There's no exponents. It's just kind of paying attention and knowing, you know, how to, you know, count and what to do with, you know, things that are type 2 and that sort of stuff. So while we're on this topic of type 2, how do you know that it's type 2? Well, you look it up on a chart. Yeah, you look it up on a chart. Chemists love charts. Chemists love exceptions to the rules, and they have charts going into detail about all the exceptions to the rules. So if somebody's going to make a chart, then use it. So yes, when you get ready to take the quiz over this chapter, when you get ready to take the exam over chapters 4 and 5, you will definitely want to have a type 2 metal ion chart at your fingertips somewhere. Marked in the book, on your favorite 
web page, I don't care. Whatever it is, you're going to want to make sure that you have that so you can refer to it. Because I don't expect you to have all of these memorized. I just want you to be familiar enough with the, the names of these that you can say, hey, wait a minute, there's something weird about iron. Is it one of those transition metals? And should I look at a chart? Because it's very simple. Just go look at a chart and figure out whether your, your um, metal is there or not. So chart usage. All right. So you haven't missed anything. You just go look at a chart. Simple. So here's a chart right here. This is the one from your book. Um, so here's chromium. Chromium is one of those. It forms a, a positive 2 as well as a positive 3. And we're showing you the, the new names, which would be chromium 2, chromium 3, as well as the old names. And we've already taken a peek at iron. Oh, look, there's cobalt. Cobalt is CO. And it can do a positive 2 and a positive 3. Tin. Uh, the root word for the Latin word for tin is stanum, which is why its older name is stannis and stanic, and why it has the abbreviation of SN. Uh, mercury is also one of those weird ones, but look at that. Mercury deviates even in its naming because its, um, its abbreviation, its symbol in the table is that HG. Oh, and that HG, I'm going to butcher this. I want to say it's um, hydrargium. Uh, and I think I butchered that, but uh, it's called mercury. And even in the older naming, they used the mercury root word to name that. And then here we have um, uh, lead, plum, plumbus, and uh, plumbic. Uh, there are more than this, but this is a good chart to use. Um, I tend not to look for the obscure ones when I put together your exams, because I don't want you to spend a lot of time having to hunt that information down. Um, so you can feel fairly safe with the ones that we've gone over in this lecture as well as what's on this chart. Um, so we have copper, iron, and lead on this chart as well as mercury, tin. Uh, zinc is also one of them. Um, so but yeah, that's, that's a little bit about the chart. What about polyatomic ion compound naming? Well, you might remember that a polyatomic ion is an ion that's made up of a group of atoms acting as a unit. So what we see here in this first example is that we have our calcium ion, and then we have this SO4 with its negative 2 charge. It takes that sulfur and those four oxygens coming together in order to create that negative 2 charge. Now, why would they do that? Why would they come together? Because when these five atoms come together in this configuration, it creates a very stable ion. Even though it bears a charge, it's highly stable. That's why we have polyatomic ions. Now, when you're dealing with polyatomic ions, you need to remember that you need to leave it written as it is. Now, the SO4 is the recipe. The two negative in the superscript is telling you about the charge. So when we start writing formulas, it's going to be important to keep that SO4 together, particularly if we need more than one SO4. So we're going to visit all of that in these next few examples so you can see how this is done. All right, so how do we name our calcium ion? Calcium ion. How do we name this SO4 with the negative 2 charge? Well, there's not a, an easy way for you to look at this and name it, but there is a chart. So go look at a chart. Your book has polyatomic ion charts in it. This one is one that shows up routinely. And if you look at it, you will see that this is called sulfate. So the way that we would name a compound made up of these two ions is we get rid of the ion in the first name, and we would simply call it calcium sulfate. Now, can we come up with a formula right here on the spot for calcium sulfate? Well, let's look at our charges. Calcium has a positive 2. The sulfate polyatomic ion has a negative 2. If we have one of each, we'll have a neutral compound because positive 2 and negative 2 cancel each other out. So we could simply write this as Ca for our calcium and SO4 for our sulfate. And we have created the formula.
right here on the spot without a great deal of extra work. Let's try another one. All right, so we have a magnesium ion. We've dealt with that before. And then we have this thing over here that is NO3. All right, can we name the magnesium? We sure can. We're going to call it magnesium ion. Can you look at NO3 and know what the name of it is? Well, perhaps if you've worked in a chemistry lab and you've dealt with this enough, maybe. But more than likely, you're going to need to go look it up on a chart, which is legit. So if you do that, you're going to find that its name is nitrate. And how are we going to name this? Get rid of ion, magnesium nitrate. Now, using red and blue switcheroo, looking at the charges, can we predict how many magnesiums we need and how many NO3s we need? Yeah, we can. So we can look at the magnitude of the charge on magnesium, which is 2, and that tells us that we're going to need two NO3s. And we can look at the magnitude of charge on NO3, nitrate, and see that we're only going to need one magnesium. So we can write our one magnesium, but we have to be careful how we write two NO3s. Because we need everything to be replicated, we're going to put that NO3 in parentheses and a 2 after that in the subscript. And that lets our readers know that we understand that nitrate, the polyatomic ion, is represented as NO3. And that when we duplicate it, when we need to say we need two of them there, we need two of them to show up as NO3. So let's take a look at another one. All right. So SN is 10. Can we name this one? Yeah, we sure can. Ooh, what's weird about 10? Hmm. Oh, I don't know. Go look at a chart. Maybe it's a type 2. Is it a type 2, somebody? It sure is. What do we have to do for type 2? Yep, you got it. We got to include the charge in the name. So this would be 10-4. 10-4, good buddy. That's right. 10-4 ion. Good job. All right, PO4 with a 3 negative charge. What's that telling us? Tell us that we need to go look at a different chart. That's what it's telling us. So if you go look this character up, you might have found that this guy is phosphate. Now, how are we going to name it? Get rid of the ion, bring it all together, 10,4-phosphate. Now, can we, can we possibly come up with a formula right here on the spot? Well, let's look at the charges in our 10. It's 4. So what is that going to tell us? It tells us that we need 4 PO4s. We need to be careful how we write that. Because PO4 needs to be all one thing. And we're going to need four of them. So we're going to need to be sure we put that in parentheses. Now what about this SN? Well, that stands for 10. It only stands for one thing. We don't have to worry about putting parentheses around it. Because SN means one thing. But we are going to need more than one. How many are we going to need? We're going to need three. And I got that by looking at the magnitude of charge on my phosphate. So to write this one out, we need SN3. We need three of those. And we need four PO4s. All right, so how are you going to see this sort of stuff on a test? Well, I'm not going to ask you to do everything in one step like we have done on the previous several slides. What you're going to see on an exam would be the formula, like CaSO4, and I'll ask you to, to name it. So you'd have to know that calcium was the calcium ion, and you would call it calcium. And that SO4, you might not know the name of that. Go look it up on a chart. It's sulfate. You would call it calcium sulfate. Just like if you saw SN3, PO4, parentheses 4, you might be a little suspicious of that SN, hopefully, and you're like, well, um, I don't really know who that is. Let me go look on a type 2 chart. You hunt around until you found that SN, and you say, oh, that's 10. And it most likely has a 4, and I would know that 
because look, there's its four right there. So we would call it 10, 4, and then phosphate, we don't have to really worry about the number, well, although we, we can pretty much conclude that it probably has a negative 3 charge on it. And um, we could just go look it up on the, period, on the uh, polyatomic ion chart and give it that name, and uh, there it is, 10,4-phosphate. So that would be one way that you would see these. The other way that you'll see these is I'll give you the name. So I could give you 10,4-phosphate, and you would basically be able, um, you would have to take this name and say, well, 10, um, would have a 4 plus charge, and phosphate, let me go look it up on a chart, PO4 with a negative 3. So um, how am I going to put the formula together? Well, I'm going to need 4 PO4s. I'm going to need 3 SNs, so I would write my formula like this. So I could give you the name, and you'd have to give me the formula. So you'll see both of those on the exam. Will you be given the formula? You give me the name, and then I give you the name, you give me the formula. Those are possibilities. But you'll see them, you know, just as a question, not doing two things at once, as we've done here. Here's the polyatomic ion chart from your book. Pretty simple. Um, and I tend to, to like to pull from the things that you have uh, readily accessible to you. So um, it is possible that from some previous permutation, I did pull in a polyatomic ion that's not on this chart. Uh, but for the most part, what you're going to see on exams will be from these, these sorts of charts. I'm going to draw your attention to one thing before we leave this chart. Actually, I'll draw your attention to two things. One thing is that if we go down the line here, we have negative, 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 negative oh, a positive. We have one positive polyatomic ion. So you might want to familiarize yourself with that. NH4 is your one positive polyatomic ion. Because generally what is taught in this course is that in order to name, in order to figure out the type of union you have with your elements, you need to look at what's in the first position and determine if it's a metal or a nonmetal. The caveat to that, because remember chemistry is full of caveats, chemistry is full of exceptions, is that sometimes what's in the first position, if it is ionically bonded, might not be a metal. It might be the ammonium ion. So familiarize yourself with that. So, uh, familiarize yourself enough so that if you see it, an alarm bell goes off and your reaction is to go look at a chart. That's what you need to learn. Now, if you happen to be sitting around studying polyatomic ion charts, you're going to notice something. And one of the things that you're going to notice is that a lot of these ions have oxygen as part of the mix. And when you have an, a polyatomic ion that has oxygen in it, they're called oxyanions. Oxy meaning, hey, there's some oxygen here, and anion meaning, and it's got a negative charge. So most polyatomic ions are oxyanions, um, and they're going to contain, like I said, oxygen and some other, some other element. Now the interesting thing about oxyanions is that they have a tendency to appear in series. So if you've looked at the chart, kind of familiarized yourself, you might have noticed something like NO2 and NO3, or SO3 and SO4. These are oxyanions, and they appear in a series. And when they appear in series, you might have noticed names like sulfite and sulfate. So is there some sort of naming convention here? Of course there is. That's what chemists do. They like to have conventions to make rules for naming things. So let's take a look at what that is. So if there are two ions in the series, the one that has fewer oxygen atoms gets the ite ending. And the one that has more oxygen atoms gets the ate ending. Does that sound kind of familiar? Kind of sounds a little bit like the us and the ick endings that we saw with those type 2 metals, doesn't it? 
Yeah, it does. It, it tells you who has more, who has less, but it doesn't tell you how many. Well, this naming convention has stuck and it's still in use, so we might as well have some idea of what it is. So let's take a look. So um, NO2 is nitrate, and there is an NO3, which is nit... Uh, I said it wrong. There's an NO2, which is nitrite, and then there's an NO3, which is a nitrate. And often they're listed side by side in these tables, and you'll notice that ite and ate format. Sulfur and oxygen is another um, oxyanion. You have a sulfite and you have a sulfate. But look, the sulfite has three oxygens. The sulfate has four. And those are not the same numbers that we see with the nitrogen and oxygen. So it doesn't tell us how many. It just tells us greater than or less than. And um, that's what we use. So um, that's what's going on with that, just so you know. Now with oxyanions, it is entirely possible that you have more than two in a series. In fact, you could have four in a series. And we see this with um, the halogens. The halogens have these oxyanions that come forward to a series. And what happens when you have that? Well, you don't say, I, I, and 8-8, eight, eight, then you add a prefix. You don't, so you're gonna, have, you keep the I and the 8, but you have to add a prefix to note that you're dealing with something that has fewer than few or greater than more. So let's take a look at what I'm talking about. So here we have chlorite and chlorate. So our chlorite has two oxygens, chlorate has three oxygens. There is a species in this series that has only one oxygen, it would also be an ite because it has fewer, but because it is one less than the chlorite, we would call it the hypochlorite. So it gets a prefix as well as that special ending. There is also a species that has one more than three oxygens, and this is what we would call perchlorate. This is the naming convention when you have four in a series. It's like they listed all four out, drew a line in the middle, declared the upper one the I, the lower one the eight, and then added prefix to designate that further change occurred. Let's look at another one. Bromite, bromate. What do you think is going to happen if we have only one oxygen? What is that name going to be? Hopefully you said hypobromite. And what if we have four oxygens in our species? Per bromate. Perfect. So this is the naming convention. So when you see these, um, you're like, oh, it's one of the, uh, in the series, and I'm looking at the hypo. That's going to be the one that probably has just one oxygen to it. Because this oxygen-halogen combination tends to follow this format of one oxygen, two oxygens, three oxygens, and four oxygens with the hypoite, ite, eight per eight naming convention. And there's one more little thing before we leave this topic, and that is the hydrated ionic compounds. So let's talk about these, these hydrates. So what is a hydrate? Well, a hydrate is an ionic compound that contains a specific number of water molecules associated with each formula unit. Now, why would it contain water molecules? Well, water molecules have a polarity, and what polarity means is that each water molecule has a positive end and it has a negative end. And water, water's everywhere. It's in the air. It's, it's everywhere. And when you have these compounds with these charges on them, they're automatically going to attract water molecules from the environment to come and join them. And so we could think of these, these hydrated formula units as formula, formula units that have basically trapped some water molecules along with them. And what's funny in nature is that they actually serve the purpose of lowering the energetics of the ionic system in these cases. And the science here is a little bit complicated for this topic at this time, but 
I showed you earlier how using the energy that gets consumed or released when ions formed and then further uh, overlaying Coulomb's law in order to get those uh, ions to attract, how that can change energy. Well, it is possible with some of these ionic compounds that you create a union that is so solid between them that it become it takes so much energy to disrupt them that it almost becomes impossible. And Mother Nature doesn't like those high energy systems. And water is easy enough to trap within these, these hydrates. And by doing so, it lowers the energy of the system so that we can manipulate these easily, which means Mother Nature can easily manipulate these compounds as well. She doesn't take her a great deal of energy to separate magnesium from sulfate. Without the presence of those water molecules, that would be the case. But the presence of the water molecules, that's a game changer. That allows Mother Nature the rule to be as lazy as she wants. She can just take that magnesium sulfate, drop it in water, and the thing dissolves without any explosion, without any significant heat release, without anything excessive happening. And because Mother Nature loves things to be simple, this is how she has handled some of these compounds. They exist as hydrates. All right, so that's the story of the hydrate. So if you happen to be working in a lab, then you're handling these samples and you would see it written this way. So part of the formula of the formula unit would include not only a magnesium and a sulfate polyatomic ion, but it would also include seven water molecules. And we have to convey that to our reader. And the way we would say that is we would name the magnesium and the sulfate just as we did previously, magnesium sulfate. But we'd also have to attach a little bit of information about those seven water molecules. So we would express the seven as a prefix, hepta. We're going to go over that in just a second. And instead of saying water, we call it hydrate because water hydrates. <laughs> That's it. What about that cobalt and chlorine conglomeration, the next one? Well, we would call it cobalt 2, because remember cobalt's uh, one of those type 2 um, type two metals. And uh, we call the chlorine chloride. And now we have to account for those six water molecules. The prefix for six would be hexa, and it would be hydrate. So that's how we would name the hydrates. There's a chart. Um, right after this, it goes into the naming of the numbers. So let's look at that. And here's the chart with the naming of our numbers. And a moment ago, we saw this one, hepta, which means seven. Um, we also saw hexa, which means six. Octa, no surprise there, means eight, because, you know, how many legs does an octopus have? Uh, tricycle has how many wheels? Three. Um, pentagon has how many parts five hemi means half mono means one di means two um, here's a chart feel free to use it so if we saw something like this how would we name it well we would name this portion as we had been working with everything else and we would call it calcium sulfate but then we would have to add this that one half gets called hemi and this water gets called hydrate and there it is right there calcium sulfate hemihydrate what about this character? Well, BA stands for barium. Our chlorine would be chloride. Six is hexa. This is hydrate. So barium chloride hexa hydrate. Here we have copper. Now copper is one of those type two, um, type twos. And we have sulfate. And up here we figured out that sulfate had a, a negative two charge. So because we only have one copper, it must have a positive two charge like our calcium. So this is most likely copper two sulfate with our five waters, which we would call pentahydrate. So that's a little bit about naming hydrates.